everyone. Today we are starting at chapter 22 and we're going for probably for over one hour because we skipped a day. Um, so let's get started. So beginning of chapter 22. Um, at the end of chapter 21, um, they, uh, they meaning Ishmael and uh, Queequeg were about to get on the ship. Um, and Captain Ahab had come on board, but they haven't met him yet. So I'm guessing they're probably going to meet him in this chapter. We'll see. Whoops. We shall see where were we. Oh no. I've lost my place. What? Chapter 21, then chapter 22. Where is it? There it is. Chapter 22. Merry Christmas. At length, towards noon, upon the final dismissal of the ship's riggers, and after the Pequod had been hauled out from the wharf, and after the ever-thoughtful Charity had come off in a whaleboat with her last, last gift, a nightcap for Stubb, the second mate, her brother-in-law, and a spare Bible for the steward. After all this, the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, issued from the cabin, and turning to the chief mate, Peleg said, Now, Mr. Starbuck, are you sure everything's right? Cap Captain Ahab is all ready. Just spoke to him. Nothing more to be got from the show, or eh? Well, call all hands, then. Muster him aft here. Blast him. No no need of profane words, however great the hurry, Peleg, said Bildad. But away with thee, friend Starbuck, and do our bidding. How now? Here upon the very point of starting for the voyage, Captain Peleg and Captain Bildad were going at it with a high hand on the quarter deck, just as if they were to be joint commanders at sea, as well as to all appearances in port. And as for Captain Ahab, no sign of him was yet to be seen. Only, they said, he was in the cabin. But then the idea was that his presence was by no means necessary in getting the ship under way and steering her well out to sea. Indeed, as that was not at all his proper business, but the pilots, and as he was not yet completely recovered, so they said, therefore Captain Ahab stayed below. And all this seemed natural enough, especially as in the merchant service, many captains never show themselves on deck for a considerable time after heaving up the, the anchor, but remain over the cabin table having a farewell merrymaking with their shore friends before they quit the ship for good with the pilot. But there was not much chance to think over the matter, for Captain Peleg was now all alive. He seemed to do most of the, most of the talking and commanding and not Bildad. Aft here, ye sons of bachelors, he cried as the sailors lingered at the mainmast. Mr. Starbrook, drive him aft. Strike the tent there, was the next order. As I hinted before, this whale one marquee was never pitched except in port. And on board the Pequod, for 30 years, the order to strike the tent was well known to be the next thing to heaving up the anchor. Man the capstan, blood and thunder, jump, was the next command, and the crew sprang for the hand spikes. Now, in getting underway, the station generally occupied by the pilot is the forward part of the ship. And here, Bildad, who, with Peleg, be it, be no, be it known, in addition to his other officers, was one of the licensed pilots of the port. He being suspected to have got himself made a pilot in order to save the Nantucket pilot fee to all the ships he was concerned in, for he never piloted any other craft. Bildad, I say, might now be seen actively engaged in looking over the bows for the approaching anchor, and at intervals singing what seemed a dismal stave of psalmody to cheer the hands at the, at the windlass, who roared forth some sort of a chorus about the girls in Booble Alley with hearty goodwill. Nevertheless, not three days previous, 
Bill Dad had told them that no profane songs would be allowed on board the Pequod, particularly in getting underway. And Charity, his sister, had placed a small choice copy of Watts in each seaman's berth. Meantime, overseeing the other part of the ship, Captain Peleg ripped and swore astern in the most frightful manner. I almost thought he would sink the ship before the anchor could be got up. Involuntarily, I paused on my handspike and told Kuikweg to do the same, thinking of the perils we both ran in starting on the voyage with such a devil for a pilot. I was comforting, my, I was comforting myself, however, with the thought that in Pious Bildad might be found some salvation, in spite of his 777th lay, when I felt a sudden sharp poke in my rear, turning around was horrified at the apparition of Captain Peleg in the act of withdrawing his leg from my immediate vicinity. That was my first kick. Is that the way they heave in the merchant service? He roared. Spring, thou sheephead, spring, and break thy backbone. Why don't ye spring, I say, all of ye. Spring, cool hog, spring, thou chap with the red whiskers. Spring there. Scotch cap. Spring, thou green pants. Spring, I say, all of ye, and spring your eyes out. And so saying, he moved along the windlass, here and there using his leg very freely, while imperturbable, imperturbable Bildad kept leading off with his psalmody. Thinks I, Captain Peleg must have been drinking something today. At last the anchor was up, the sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, cold Christmas. And as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing spray cased us in ice as in polished armor. The long rows of teeth on the bulwarks glistened in the moonlight, and like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant, vast curving icicles depended from the bows. Lank Bildad, as pilot, headed the first watch, and ever and anon, as the old craft deep-dived into the green seas, and sent the shivering frost all over her, and the will winds howled, and the cordage rang, his steady notes were heard. Sweet fields beyond the swelling flood stand dressed in living green. So to the Jews old Canaan stood, while Jordan rolled between. Never did those, did those sweet words sound more sweetly to me than then. They were full of hope and fruition. In spite of this frigid winter night in the boisterous Atlantic, in spite of my wet feet and wetter jacket, there was yet, it then seemed to me, many a pleasant haven in store. And meads and glades so eternally vernal that the grass shot up by the spring, untrodden, unwilted, remains at midsummer. At last we gained such an offing that the two pilots were needed no longer. The stout sailboat that had accompanied us began ra ranging alongside. It was curious and not unpleasing how Bildad and Peleg were affected at this juncture, especially Captain Bildad. For loath to depart yet, very loath to leave, for a good, for a good, a ship bound on so long and perilous a voyage beyond both stormy capes, a ship in which some thousands of his hard-earned dollars were invested, a ship in which an old shipmate sailed as captain, a man almost as old as he, once more starting to encounter all the terrors of the pitiless jaw. Loath to say goodbye to a thing so every way brimful of every interest to him, poor old Bildad lingered long, paced the deck with anxious strides, ran down into the cabin to speak another farewell word there, again came on deck and looked to windward, looked, looked towards the wide and endless waters, only bounded by the far-off, unseen eastern continents, looked towards the land, looked aloft, looked right and left, looked everywhere and nowhere, and at last, mechanically coiling a rope upon its spin, convulsively grasped stout Peleg by the hand, and holding up a lantern for, the, for a moment, stood gazing heroically in his face, as much as to say, nevertheless, friend Peleg, I can stand it. Yes, I can. As for Peleg himself, he took it more like a philosopher, but for all his philosophy, there was a tear twinkling in his eye when the lantern came too near, and he too did not a little run from cabin to deck, now a word below, and now a word with Starbuck, Starbuck the chief mate. But, at last, he turned to his comrade with a final sort of look about him. Captain Bildad, come, old shipmate, we must go. 
Back the main yard there. Boat ahoy. Stand by to come close alongside now. Careful, careful. Come, Bildad boy. Say your last. Luck to ye, Starbuck. Luck to ye, Mr. Stubb. Luck to ye, Mr. Flask. Goodbye and good luck to ye all. And this day, three years, I'll have a hot supper smoking for ye in old Nantucket. Hurrah and away. God bless ye and have ye in his holy keeping, men, murmured old Bildad, almost incoherently. I hope ye'll have fine weather now, so that Captain Ahab may soon be moving among ye. A pleasant sun is all he needs, and ye'll have plenty of them in the tropic voyage ye go. Be careful in the hunt, ye mates. Don't stave the boats needlessly, ye harbooners. Good white cedar plank is raised to full 3% within the year. Don't forget your pray there, pr prayers either, Mr. Starbuck. Mind that Cooper don't waste the spare staves. Oh, the sail needles are in the green locker. Don't wail it too much, a lord, days, men. But don't miss a fair chance either. That's rejecting heaven's good gifts. Have an eye to the molasses tears, Mr. Stubb. It was a little leaky, I thought. If he touch at the islands, Mr. Flask, be beware of fornication. Goodbye, goodbye. Don't keep that cheese too long down in the hold, Mr. Starbuck. It'll spoil. Be careful with the butter. Twenty cents the pound it was, and mind ye if... Come, come, Captain Bildad. Stop palavering. Away. And with that, Peleg hurried him over the side and both dropped into the boat. Ship and boat diverged. The cold, damp night breeze blew between. A screaming gull flew overhead. The two hulls wildly rolled. We gave three heavy-hearted cheers and blindly pull, plunged like fate into the lone Atlantic. Chapter 23, The Lee Shore Some chapters back, one Bulkington was spoke of, a tall New London mariner, encountered in, the, in New Bedford at the inn. When on that shivering winter's night the Pequod thrust her vindictive bows into the cold, malicious waves, who should I see standing at her helm but Bulkington? I looked with sympathetic awe and fearfulness upon the man, who in midwinter had just landed from a four years dangerous voyage could so unrestingly push off again for still another tempestuous term. The land seemed scorching to his feet. Wonderfulest things are ever the unmentionable. Deep memories yield no epitaphs. The six inch chapter is the stoneless grave of Bulkington. Let me only say that it fared with him as with the storm wi star fared with him as with the storm tossed ship that miserably drives along the leeward land. The port would fain give succor. The port is pitiful. The port is safety, comfort, hearthstone, supper, warm blankets, friends, all that's kind to our mortal mortalities. But in that gale, the port, the land, is that ship's direst jeopardy. She must fly all hospitality. One touch of land, though it but graze the keel, it would make her shudder through and through. With all her might she crowds all sail offshore, and in so doing fights against the very winds that fain would blow her homeward, seeks all the lashed seas landlessness again. For refuge's sake, forlornly rushing into the peril, her only friend, her bitterest foe. Know ye now, Bulkington? glimpses do ye seem to see of that mortally intolerable truth that all deep earnest thinking is but the intrepid effort of the soul to keep the open independence of her sea while the wildest winds of heaven and earth conspire to cast her on the treacherous slavish shore but as in landlessness alone resides the highest truth shoreless indefinite as god but so better is it to perish in that howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if that were safety. For worm-like then, oh, who would crave and crawl to land? Terrors of the terrible, is all this agony so vain? Take heart, take heart, o old Bulkington. Bear thee grimly, demigod, up from the spray of thy ocean perishing. Straight up leaps thy apotheosis. Chapter 24, The Advocate As Queequeg and I are now fairly embarked in this business of whaling, and as this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded among landsmen as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit, therefore I am all anxiety to convince ye, ye landsmen, of the injustice hereby done to us hunters of whales. 
In the first place, it may be deemed almost superfluous to establish the fact <sighs> that among people at large, the business of whaling is not accounted on a level with what are called the liberal professions. If a stranger were introduced to any miscellaneous metropolitan society, it would but slightly advance the general opinion of his merits, where he presented the, to the company as a harpooner, say, and if in emulation of naval officers, he should append the initials SWF, sperm whale fishery, to his visiting card, such a procedure would be deemed preeminently presuming and ridiculous. Doubtless, one, doubtless, one leading reason why the world declines honoring us whalemen is this. They think that, at best, our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, and that when actively engaged therein, we are surrounded by all manner of defilements. Butchers we are, that is true, but butchers also, and butchers of the bloodiest badge, have been all martial commanders whom the world invariably delights to honor. And as for the matter of the alleged uncleanliness of our business, he shall soon be initiated into certain facts hitherto pretty generally unknown, and which, upon the whole, will triumphantly plant the sperm whale ship at least among the cleanliest things of this tidy earth. But even granting the charge in question to be true, what disordered slippery decks of a whale ship are co comparable to the unspeakable carrion of those battlefields from which so many soldiers return to drink in all ladies' plaudits? To drink in all ladies' plaudits? And if the idea of peril so much enhances the popular conceit of the soldier's profession, let me assure you that many a veteran who has freely moshed up to a battery would quickly recoil at the apparition of the sperm whale's vast tail, fanning into eddies over the, eddies the air over his head. For what are the comprehensible terrors of man compared with the interlinked terrors and wonders of God? But, though the world scouts at us with scouts at us whale hunters, yet it does unwittingly pay us the profoundest homage, yea, an all abounding adoration, for almost all the tapers, lamps, and candles that burn round the globe burn as before so many shrines to our glory. But look at this matter in other lights. In other lights, weighed in all sorts of scales, see what we whalemen are and have been. Why did the Dutch in DeWitt's time have admirals of her whaling fleets? Why did Louis the Sixteenth of France, at his own personal expense, expense fit out whaling ships from Dunkirk and politely invite to that town some score or two of families from our own island of Nantucket? Why did Britain, between the years of 1750 and 1788, pay to her whalemen in bounties upwards of one million pounds? And lastly, how comes it that we whalemen of America now outnumber all the rest of the banded whalemen in the world? Sail a navy of upwards of 700 vessels, man manned by 18,000 men, yearly consuming four million of dollars, the ship's worth at the time of sailing, 20 million dollars? and every year importing into our harbors a well-reaped harvest of seven million dollars. How comes all this if there not be something poisson in whaling? But this is not the half. Look again. I freely assert that the cosmopolite philosopher cannot, for his life, point out one single peaceful influence, which within the last 60 years has operated more potentially upon the whole broad world, Taking in, taken in one aggregate than the high and mighty business of whaling, one way and another, it has, begot, it has begotten events so remarkable in themselves and so continuously momentous in their sequential issues that whaling may well be regarded as that Egyptian mother who bore offspring themselves pregnant from her womb. It would be a hopeless, endless task to catalog all these things. Let a handful suffice. For many years past the whale ship for many years past, the whale ship has been the pioneer in ferreting out the remotest and least known parts of the earth. She has explored seas and archipelagos which had no chart, where no Cook or Vancouver had ever sailed. If American and European men of war now peacefully ride in once savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way, and first interpreted between them and the savages. They may celebrate, as they will, the heroes of exploring expeditions, your cooks, your Chris Sterns, but I say that scores of anonymous captains have sailed out of Nantucket that were as great and greater than your cook and your Chris Stern. For in their succorless empty-handedness, they, 
in the heathenish sharked waters and by the beaches of unrecorded javelin islands, battled with virgin wonders and terrors that Cook with all his marin marines and muskets would not willingly have dared. All that it's made with such a flourish of in the South Sea voyages, those things were but the lifetime commonplaces of our heroic Nantucketers. Often, adventures which Vancouver dictates three chapters, dedicates three chapters to, these men accounted unworthy of being set down in the ship's common log. Ah, the world! Oh, the world! Until the whale fishery rounded Cape Horn, com no commerce but colonial, scarcely any intercourse but colonial, was carried on between Europe and the long time, and the long line of opulent Spanish provinces on the, on the Pacific coast. It was the whalemen who first broke through the jealous policy of the Spanish crown, touching those colonies, and, if space permitted, it might be distinctly shown how, from those whalemen, at last eventuated the liberation of Peru, Chile, and Bolivia from the yoke of old Spain, and the establishment of the, sen of the eternal democracy in those parts. That great America on the other side of the sphere, Australia, was given to the enlightened world by the whalemen. After its first blunderborn discovery by a Dutchman, all other ships long shunned those shores as pestiferously barbarous. But the whale ship touched there. The whale ship is the true mother of that now mighty colony. Moreover, in the infancy of the first Australian settlement, the emigrants were several times saved from starvation by the benevolent biscuit of the whale ship, luckily dropping an anchor in their waters. The uncounted isles of all Polynesia confess the same truth and do commercial homage to the whale ship that cleared the way for the missionary and the merchant and in many cases carried the primitive missionaries to their first destinations. If that double-bolted land, Japan, is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale ship alone to whom the credit will be due, for already she is on the threshold. But if, in the face of all this, you still declare that whaling has no aesthetically noble associations connected with it, then am I ready to shiver fifty lances with you there and unhorse you with a split helmet every time? The whale has no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler, you will say. The whale no famous author and whaling no famous chronicler? Who wrote the first account of our Leviathan? Who but mighty Job? And who composed the first narrative of a whaling voyage? Well, who but no less a prince than Alfred the Great, who, with his own royal pen, took down the words from other, the Norwegian whale hunter of those times? And who pronounced our glowing eulogy in Parliament? Who but Edmund Burke? True enough, but then whalemen themselves are poor devils. They have no good blood in their veins. No good blood in their veins? They have something better than royal blood there. The grandmother of Benjamin Franklin was Mary Morell. Afterwards, by marriage, Mary Folger, one of the old settlers of Nantucket, and the ancestress to a long line of Folgers and Harpooners, all kith and kin to noble Benjamin, this day darting the barbed iron from one side of the world to the other. Good again, but then all confess that somehow whaling is not respectable. Whaling not respectable? Whaling is imperial. By old English statutory law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Oh, that's only nominal. The whale himself has never figured in any grand imposing way. The whale never figured in any grand imposing way. In one of the mighty triumphs given to a Roman general upon his entering the world's capital, the bones of a whale brought all the way from the Syrian coast where the most conspicuous object in the sim where the most conspicuous object in the symboled procession see subsequent chapters for more something more on this head grant it since you cite it but say what you will there's no real dignity in whaling no dignity in whaling the dignity of our calling the very heavens attest Cetus is a constellation in the south, no more. Drive down your hat in the in presence of the czar and take it off to Queequeg, no more. I know a man that in his lifetime has taken 350 whales. I, I account that man more honorable than, the, than that great captain of antiquity who boasted of taking as many walled towns. And as for me, 
If by any possibility there be yet as yet undiscovered prime thing in me, if I shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high hushed world, which I might not be unreasonably ambi ambitious of, if hereafter I shall do anything that upon the whole a man might rather have done than to have left undone, if at my death my executors, or more properly my creditors, find any precious MSS in my desk, then here I prospectively ascribe all the honor and the glory to whaling. For a whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. Chapter 25, Postscript. In behalf of the dignity of whaling, I would fain advance not but substantiated facts. But after embattling his facts, an advocate who should wholly suppress a not unreasonable surmise, which might tell eloquently upon his cause, such an advocate, would he not be blameworthy? It is well known that at the coronation of kings and queens, even modern ones, a certain curious process of seasoning them for their functions has gone through. There is a salt cellar of state, of state so-called, and there may be a castor of state. How they use the salt precisely, who knows? Certain I am, however, that a king's head is solemnly oiled at his coronation, even as a head of salad. Can it be, though, that they anoint it with a view of making its interior run well as they anoint machinery? Much might be ruminated here concerning the essential dignity of this regal process, because in common life we esteem but meanly and contemptibly a fellow who anoints his hair, and palpably smells of that anointing. In truth, a mature man who uses hair oil, unless medicinally, that man has probably got a quaggy spot in him somewhere. As a general rule, he can't amount to much in his totality. But the only thing to be considered here is this. What kind of oil is used at coronations? Certainly it cannot be olive oil, or, or nor macassar oil, nor castor oil, nor bear's oil, nor train oil, not, nor cod liver oil. What then can it possibly be but sperm oil in its unmanufactured, unpolluted state, the sweetest of all oils? Think of that, ye loyal Bretons. We whalemen supply your kings and queens with coronation stuff. Chapter 26, Knights and Squires. The chief mate of the Pequod was Starbuck, a native of Nantucket, and a Quaker by descent. He was a long, earnest man, and though born on an icy coast, seemed well adapted to endure hot latitudes, his flesh being hard as twice baked biscuit. Transported to the Indies, his live blood will not spoil like bottled ale. He must have been born in some time of general drought and famine, or upon one of those fast days for which his state is famous. Only some thirty arid summers had he seen, though summers had dried up all his physical superfluousness. But this, his thinness, so to speak, seemed no more the token of wasting anxieties and cares than it seemed the indication of any bodily blight. It was merely the condensation of the man. He was by no means ill-looking, quite the contrary. His pure tight skin was an excellent fit, and closely wrapped up in it and embalmed with inner health and strength, like a revivified Egyptian, this Starbuck seemed to prepare to endure for long ages to come, and to endure always, as now, for it'd be polar snow or torrid sun like a patent chronometer. His interior vitality was warranted to do well in all climates. Looking into his eyes, you seemed to see there the yet lingering images of those thousandfold perils he had calmly confronted through life. A staid, a steadfast man, whose life for the most part was telling pantomime was a telling pantomime of action, and not a tame chapter of sounds. Yet, for all his hardy sobriety and fortitude, there were certain qualities in him which at times affected, and in some case seemed well nigh to overbalance all the rest. Uncommonly conscientious for a seaman, and endued, and endued with a deep and natural reverence, the wild watery loneliness of his life did therefore it strongly incline him to superstition. But to that sort of superstition, in which some organizations seem, seems rather to spring, from intelligence than from ignorance. Outward portents and inward present times were his, and if at times these things bent the wedded 
welded iron of his soul, much more did his faraway domestic memories of his young cape wife and child tend to bend him still more from the original ruggedness of his nature and open him still further to those latent influences which in some honest-hearted men restrain the gush of daredevil daring, so often invinced by others in the more perilous vicissitudes of the fishery. I will have no man in my boat, said Starbuck, who is not afraid of a whale. By this, he seemed to mean not only that the most reliable and useful courage was that which arises from this fair estimation of the encountered peril, but that an utterly fearless man is a far more dangerous comrade than a coward. Aye, aye, said Stubb with the second mate. Starbuck there is as careful a man as you'll find anywhere in this fishery. But we shall ere long see what that word careful precisely means when used by a man like Stubb, or almost any other whale hunter. Starbuck was no crusader after perils. In him, courage was not a sentiment, but a thing simply useful to him, and always at hand upon all mortally practical occasions. Besides, he thought, perhaps, that in this business of whaling, courage was one of the great stable outfits of the ship, like her beef and her bread, and not to be foolishly wasted. Wherefore, he had no fancy for lowering for whales after sundown, nor for persisting in fighting a fish that too much persisted in fighting him. For, thought Starbuck, I am here on this critical ocean to kill whales for my living, and not to be killed by them for theirs, and that hundreds of men had been kill so killed, Starbuck well knew. What doom was his own father's? Where, in the bottomless deeps, could he find the torn limbs of his brother? With memories like these in him, and, moreover, given to a certain superstitiousness, as has been said, the courage of the Starbuck, which could, nevertheless, still flourish, must indeed have been extreme. But it was not in reasonable nature to that a man so organized, and with such terrible experiences and rem remembrances as he had, it was not in nature that these things should fail in latently engendering an element in him, which, under suitable circumstances, would break out from his confinement and burn all his courage up. And brave as he might be, it was that sort of bravery chiefly, visible in some intrepid men, which, generally abiding firm in the conflict with seas or winds or whales or any of the ordinary irrational horrors of the world, yet cannot withstand those more terrific, because more spiritual terrors which sometimes menace you from the concentrating brow of an enraged and mighty man. But were the coming narrative to reveal in any instance the complete abasement of poor Starbuck's fortitude, scarce might I have heart, the heart to write it. For it is, thing mo it is a thing most sorrowful, nay, shocking, to expose the fall of valor and the soul. Men may seem detest detestable as joint stock companies and nations. Knaves, fools, and murderers there may be. Men may have mean and meager faces. But man, in the ideal, is so noble and so sparkling that such a grand and glowing creature that over any ignominious blemish in him all his fellows should run to throw their costliest robes. That immaculate manliness we feel within ourselves, so far within us that it remains intact, though all the outer character seem to be gone, seem gone, bleeds with keenest anguish at the undraped spectacle of a valor-ruined man. Nor can piety itself such a shameful sight, completely stifle her upbraidings against the permitting stars. But this august dignity I treat of is not the dignity of kings in robes, but that abounding dignity which has no robed investiture. Thou shalt see it shining in the arm that wields a pick or drives a spike, the democratic dignity which, on all hands, radiates without and from God himself, the great God absolute, the center and circumference of all democracy, his omnipresence, our divine equality. If, then, to meanest mariners and renegades and castaways, I shall hereafter ascribe, ascribe high qualities, though dark, weave round them tragic graces of even the most mournful, perchance the most abased among them all, shall at times lift himself to the exalted mounts. If I shall touch that workman's arm with some ethereal light, if I shall spread a rainbow over his disastrous set of sun, then, against all mortals' critics, 
bear me out in it, thou just spirit of equality, which hast spread one royal mantle of humanity over all my kind. Bear me out in it, thou great democratic God, who didst not, not refuse to the swart convict, convict Bunyan the pale poetic pearl. Thou who didst clothe with doubly hammered leaves of finest gold, the stumped and paupered arm of old Cervantes. Thou who didst pick up Andrew Jackson from the pebbles, who didst hurl him upon a war horse, who didst th thunder him higher than a throne. Thou who in all thy mighty earthly marchings ever callest thy selectest champions from the kingly commons, bear me out in it, O God. Wait, what? Andrew Jackson? Get out of here. Chapter 27, Knights and Squires. Stubb was the second mate. He was a cat. He was a native of Cape Cod, and hence, according to local usage, was called was a was called a Cape Cod man, a happy-go-lucky, neither craven nor valiant, nor valiant, taking perils as they came with an indifferent air, and while engaged in the most imminent crisis of the chase, toiling away calm and collected as a journeyman joiner, engaged for the year, good-humored easy and careless he presided over his whaleboat as if the most deadly encounter were but a dinner and his crew all invited guests he was as particular about the comfortable arrangement of his boat of his part of the boat as an old stage driver is about the snugness of his box when close to the whale in the very death lock of the fight he handled his unpitying lines coolly and offhandedly as a whistling tinker his hammer. He would hum over his old rigadig tunes, while flank and flank with the most exasperated monster. Long usage had, for this stub, converted jaw the jaws of death into an easy chair. What he thought of death itself, there is no telling. Whether he ever thought of it at all might be a question, but if he ever did chance to cast his mind that way after a comfortable dinner, no doubt like a good sailor, he took it to be a sort of call of the watch to tumble aloft and bestir themselves there about something which he would find out when he obeyed the order and not sooner. What perhaps with other things made Stubb such an easygoing, unfearing man, so cheerily trudging off with the burden of life in a world full of grave peddlers, all bowed to the ground with their packs? What helped to bring about that almost impious good humor of his? That thing must have been his pipe. For, like his nose, his short black little pipe was one of the regular features of his face. You would almost as soon have expected him to turn out of his bunk without without his nose as without his pipe. He kept a whole row of pipes there, ready loaded, stuck in a rack, with an easy reach of his hand. And whenever he turned in, he smoked them all out into succession lighting one from the other to the end of the chapter, then loading them again to be in readiness anew. For, when Stubb dressed, instead of first putting his, leg into his legs into his trousers, he put his pipe into his mouth. I say this continual smoking must have been one cause, at least, of his peculiar disposition, for everyone knows that, his, that this earthly air, whether ashore or afloat, is terribly infected with the nameless miseries of the numberless mortals who have died exhaling it. Uh, and as in the time of the cholera, some people go about with a camphorated handkerchief to their mouths. So, likewise, against all mortal tribulations, Stubb's tobacco smoke might have operated as a sort of disinfecting agent. The third mate was Flask, a native of Tisbury, in Martha's Vineyard. A short, stout, ruddy young fellow, very pugnacious concerning whales, who somehow seemed to think that the great leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him, and therefore it was a sort of point of honor with him to destroy them whenever encountered. So utterly lost was he to all sense of reverence for the many marvels of their majestic bulk and mystic ways, and so dead to anything like an apprehension of any possible danger from encountering them, that in his pure, poor opinion, the wondrous whale was but a species of mag magnified mouse, or at least water rat, requiring only a little circumvention and some small application of time and trouble in order to kill and boil. 
this ignorant, unconscious fearlessness of his made him a little waggish in the matter of whales. He followed these fish for the fun of it, and a three years voyage round Cape Horn was only a jolly joke that lasted that length of time. As a carpenter's nails are divided into wrought nails and cut nails, so mankind may be similarly divided. Little Flask was one of the wrought ones, made to clinch tight and last long. They called him King Post on board of the Pequod, because, in form, he could be well likened to the short, square timber known by that name in Arctic whalers, and which, by the means of many radiating side timbers inserted into it, serves to brace the ship against ice icy concussions of those battering seas. Now these three mates, Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask, were momentous men. They it was who by universal prescription commanded three of the Pequod's boats as headsmen. In that grand order of battle in which Captain Ahab would probably marshal his forces to descend on the whales, these three headsmen were as captains of companies. Or, being armed with their long, keen whaling spears, they were as a picked trio of lancers, even as the harpooners were flingers of javelins. And since in this famous fishery each mate or headsman, like a gothic knight of old, is always accompanied by his boat steerer or harpooner, who in certain conjunctures provides him with fresh lands. When the former one has been badly twisted or elbowed in the assault, and moreover, as there generally subsists between the two a close intimacy and friendliness, it is therefore but meet that in this place we set down who the Pequod's harpooners were and to what headsmen each of them belonged. First of all was Queequeg, whom Starbuck, the chief mate, has selected for a squire. But Queequeg is already known. Next was Tashtego, an unmixed Indian from Gay Head, the most westerly promontory of Martha's Vineyard, where there still exists the last remnant of a village of red men, who ha which has long supplied the neighboring island of Nantucket with many of her most daring harpooners. In the fishery, they usually go by the generic name of gay headers. Tashtego, Tashtego's long, lean, sable hair, his high cheekbones and black rounding eyes, for an Indian, oriental in their largeness, but Antarctic in their glittering expression. All this sufficiently proclaimed him, proclaimed him an inheritor of the unvitiated blood of those proud warrior hunters, who, in the quest of the great New England moose, had scoured, bow in hand, the aboriginal forests of the Maine. But no longer snuffing in the trail of the wild beasts of the woodland, Tashtego now hunted in the wake of the great whales of the sea, the unerring harpoon of the sun, fitly replacing the infallible arrow of the sires. To look at the tawny brawn of his lithe, snaky limbs, you would have almost credited the superstitions of some earlier Puritans and half believed this wild Indian to be the son of a prince of the powers of the air. Tashtega was Stubb, the second mate's squire. Third among the harpooners was Dagu, uh -oh. a gigantic coal-black negro savage with a lion-like tread and ahasueros to behold. Suspended from his ears were two golden hoops, so large that the sailors called them ring bolts, and would talk of securing the top sail halyards to them. In his youth, Dagu had voluntarily shipped on board of a whaler, lying in a lonely bay on his native coast. And never having been anywhere in the world but in Africa, Nantucket, and the pagan harbors most frequented by whalemen, and having now led for many years the bold life of the fishery and the ships of owners uncommonly heedful of what manner of men they shipped, Dagu retained all his barbaric virtues, and erect as a giraffe, moved about the deck, the decks in all the pomp of six feet five in his socks. There was a corporeal humility in looking up at him, and a white man standing before him seemed a white flag come to beg truce of a fortress. Curious to tell this imperial negro, Ahasuerus, Dagu, 
was the squire of Little Flask who looked like a chessman beside him. As for the residue of the, of the Pequod's company, be it said that at present day, not one in two of the many thousand men before the mast employed in the American whale fishery are Americans born, though pretty nearly all the officers are. Herein it is the same with the American whale fishery as with the American army and military and merchant navies and the engineering forces employed in the construction of the American canals and railroads. The same I say because in all these cases, the Native American liberally provides the brains, though the rest of the world is generously supplying the muscles. No small number of these whaling seamen belonged to the Azores, where the outward-bound Nantucket whalers frequently touched to augment their crews from the hardy peasants of those rocky shores. In like manner, the Greenland whalers, sailing out of Hull or London, put in at the Shetland Islands to receive the full complement of their crew. Upon the passage homewards, they dropped them there again. How it is, there is no telling, but islanders seem to make the best whalemen. They were nearly all islanders in the Pequod. Isolatoes, too, I call such, not acknowledging the common continent of men, but each isolato living on a separate continent of his own. Yet now, federated along one keel, what a set of isolatos were, what a set these isolatos were, isolatos were, and anarch, oh God, and anacarsis colludes deputation from all isles of the sea and all the ends of the earth, accompanying old Ahab and the Pequod to lay the world's grievances before that bar from which not very many of them ever came back. Black little Pip. He never did. Oh no, he went before. Poor Alabama boy. On the grim Pe Pequod's forecastle, ye shall ere long see him, beating his tambourine, prelusive of the eternal time when sent for to the great quarter deck on high. He was bid strike in with angels, and beat his tambourine in glory, called a coward here, hailed a, halo ha hailed a hero there. Chapter 28, Ahab. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches, and for aught that could be seen to the contrary, they seemed to be the only count commanders of the ship. Only they sometimes issued from the cabin with orders so sudden and peremptory that after all it, that after all it was plain they but commanded vicariously. Yes, their supreme lord and dictator was there, though hitherto unseen by any eyes not permitted to penetrate into the now sacred retreat of the cabin. Every time I ascended to the deck for my watches below, I instantly gazed aft to mark if any strange face were visible. For my first vague disquietude touching the unknown captain, now in the seclusion of the sea, became almost a perturbation. This was strangely heightened at times, but by the ragged Elijah's diabolical incoherences uninvitedly recurring to me, with a subtle energy I could not have before conceived of. But poorly could I withstand them, much as in other moods I was almost ready to smile at the solemn whimsicalities of that outlandish prophet of the wharves. But whatever it was of apprehensiveness or uneasiness, to call it so, which I felt yet whenever I came to look about me in the ship, it seemed against all warranty, warranty to cherish such emotions. For though the harpooners with the great body of the crew were a far more barbaric, heathenish, and motley set than any of the tame merchant ship companies which my previous experiences had made me acquainted with, still I ascribed this, and rightly ascribed it, to the fierce a uniqueness of the very nature of that wild the Scandinavian vocation in which I had so abandonedly embarked, embarked. But it was especially the aspect of the three chief officers of the ship, the mates, which was most forcibly calculated to allay these colorless misgivings, to induce confidence and cheerfulness in every presentment of the voyage. Three better, more likely sea officers and men, each in his own different way, could not readily be found and they were every one of them Americans. A Nantucketer, a vineyarder, a Cape man. Now, it being Christmas, when the ship 
shot from out shot from out her harbor for a space we had biting polar weather though all the time running away from it to the southward and by every degree and minute of latitude which we sailed gradually leaving that merciless winter and all its intolerable weather behind us it was one of those less lowering but still gray and gloomy enough mornings of the transition when with a fair wind the ship was rushing through the water with a vindictive sort of leaping and melancholy rapidity that as i mounted to the deck at the f call of the forenoon watch so soon as i leveled my glance towards the taffrail foreboding shivers ran over me reality outran apprehension captain ahab stood upon his quarter deck Whoa. there seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him nor of the recovery from any he looked like a man cut away from the stake when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them or taking away one particle from their compacted aged robustness his whole head high broad form his whole high broad form seemed made of solid bronze and shaped in an unalterable mold like selene's cast perseus threading its way out from among his gray hairs and continuing right down one side of his tawny scorched face and neck till it disappeared in his clothing you saw a slender rod-like mark lividly whitish it resembled that perpendicular seam sometimes made in the straight lofty trunk of a great tree when the upper lightning caringly darts down it and without wrenching a single twig peels and grooves out the bark from top to bottom air running off into the soil leaving the tree still greenly alive but branded whether that mark was born with him or whether it was the scar left by some desperate wound no one could certainly say by some tacit consent throughout the voyage literal little or no allusion was made to it especially by the mates but once tashtego senior an old gay head indian among the crew superstitiously asserted that not till he was full 40 years old did ahab become that way branded and then it came upon him not in the fury of any mortal fray but in an elemental strife at sea yet this wild hint seemed inferentially negatived by what a gray mac manxman insinuated an old sepulchral man who having never before sailed out of nantucket had never ere this laid eye upon whale wild ahab nevertheless the old sea traditions the immemorial credulities popularly invested this old manxman with preternatural powers of discernment so that no white sailor seriously contradicted him when he said that if ever captain ahab should be tranquilly laid out which might be hardly which might hardly come to pass so he muttered then whoever should do that last office for the dead would find a birthmark on him from crown to soul so powerfully did the whole grim aspect of ahab affect me and the livid brand which streaked it that for the first few moments i hardly noted that not a little of his overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood it had previously come to me that this ivory leg it had at sea been fashioned from the old polished bone of the sperm whale's jaw ay he was dismasted off japan said the old gay head indian once but like his dismasted craft he shipped another mast without coming home from it he has a quiver of him i was struck with the singular posture he maintained upon each side of the pequod's quarter deck and pretty close to the mizzen shrouds there was an auger hole bored about half an inch or so into the plank his bone leg steadied in that hole one arm elevated and holding by a shroud captain ahab stood erect looking straight out beyond the ship's ever pitching prow there <clears throat> excuse me there was an infinity of firmest fortitude a determinate unsurrenderable willfulness in the fixed and fearless forward dedication of that glance 
Not a word he spoke, nor did his officers say aught to him, though by all their minutest gestures and expressions they plainly showed the uneasy, if not painful, consciousness of being under a troubled master eye. And not only that, but moody, stricken Ahab stood before them with a crucifixion on his face. In all the nameless, regal, overbearing dignity of some mighty woe, Ere long, from his first visit in the air, he withdrew into his cabin. But after that morning, he was every day visible to the crew, either standing in his pivot hole or seated upon an ivory stool he had, or heavily walking the deck. As the sky grew less gloomy, he, indeed, he began to grow a little genial. He became less and less of recluse, as if when the ship had sailed from home, nothing but the dead, wintry blankness of the sea had kept him so secluded. And, by and by, it came to pass that he was almost continually in the air. But, as yet, for all that he said, or perceptibly did, on that on the at last sunny deck, he seemed un as unnecessary there as another mast. But the Pequod was only making a passage now, not regularly cruising. Nearly all whaling preparatives needing supervision and the mates supervision, the mates were fully competent to, so that there was little or nothing out of himself to employ or excite Ahab now. And thus chase away for that one interval the clouds that layer upon layer were piled upon his brow, as ever all crowds choose the loftiest peaks to pile themselves upon. Nevertheless, ere long, the warm, warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to charm him from his mood. For, as when the red-cheeked dancing girls, April and May, trip home to the wintry, misanthropic woods, even the barest, ruggedest, most thunder-cloven old oak will at least send forth some new, few, some few green, green sprouts to welcome such glad heart glad-hearted visitants. So Ahab did, in the end, a little respond to the playful allurings of that girlish air. More than once did he put forth the faint blossom of a look, which, in any other man, would have soon flowered out in a smile. Chapter 29 Enter Ahab, to him, Stubb. Some days elapsed, and ice and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quitos Quito spring, which at sea almost perpetually resigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing, perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of Persian sherbet, heaped up, flaked up with rose water snow. The starred and stately knights seemed haughty dames in jeweled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride, the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden helmeted sons. For sleeping men, twas hard to choose between some such winsome days and such seducing nights. But all the witcheries of that unwaning weather did not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward, they turned upon the soul especially when the still mild hours of eve came on. Then memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights. And all these subtle agencies, more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. Old age is always wakeful, as if the longer linked with life, the less man has to do with aught that looks like death. Among sea commanders, the old greybeards will oftenest leave their berths to visit the night-cloaked deck. It was so with Ahab, only that now, of late, he seemed so much to live in the open air that, truly speaking, his visits were more to the cabin than from the cabin to the planks. It feels like going down into one's tomb, he would mutter to himself, for an old captain like me to be descending this narrow scuttle to go to my grave-dug berth. So, almost every twenty-four hours, when the watches of the night were set, and the band on deck sentineled the slumbers of the band below, and when, if a rope was to be hauled upon the forecastle, the sailors flung it not rudely down as by day, but with some cautiousness dropped it 
to its place for fear of disturbing their slumbering shipmates. When this sort of steady quietude would begin to prevail habitually, the silent steersman would botch the cabin scuttle, and ere long the old man would emerge, gripping at the iron banister to help his crippled way. Some considering touch of humanity was in him, for at times like these he usually abstain, abstained from patrolling the quarter deck, because to his wearied mates, seeking repose within six inches of his ivory heel, such would have been the reverberating crack and din of that bony step, that their dreams would have been on the crunching teeth of sharks. But once the mood was on him too deep for common regardings, and as with heavy lumber-like pace he was measuring the ship from taffrail to mainmast. mainmast. Stubb, the old ship second mate, came up from below, with a certain unassured, deprecating humorous, humorousness, hinted that if Captain Ahab was pleased to walk the planks, then no one could say nay, but there might be some way of muffling the noise, hinting something indistinct, indistinctly and hesitatingly about a globe of tow, globe of tow, and the insertion into it of the ivory teal, ivory heel. Ah, Stub, thou didst not know, didst not know Ahab then. Am I a cannonball, Stub? said Ahab, that thou wouldst wad me that fashion? Go, but go thy ways, I had forgot, below to thy nightly grave, where such as ye sleep between shrouds, to use ye to the filling one at last. Down, dog, and kennel. Starting at the unforeseen concluding exclamation of the so suddenly scornful old man, Stubb was speechless for a moment, and then said excitedly, I am not used to be spoken to that way, sir. I do but less than half like it, sir. Avast, gritted Ahab between his set teeth, and violently moving away as if to avoid some passionate temptation. No, sir, not yet, said Stubb, emboldened. I will not be tamely called a dog, sir. Then be called ten times a donkey, and a mule, and an ass, and be gone, or I'll clear the world of thee. As he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. I was never served so before without giving a hard blow for it, muttered Stubb, as he found himself descending the cabin scuttle. It's very queer. Stop, Stubb. Somehow, now, I don't well know whether to go back and strike him, or what's that, down here on my knees and pray for him? Yes, that was the thought coming up in me, but it would be the first time I ever did pray. It's queer, very queer, and he's queer too, aye, take him fore and aft, he's about the queerest old man Stubb ever assailed with. How he flashed at me, his eyes like powder pans. Is he mad? Anyway, there's something on his mind, as sure as there must be something on a deck when it cracks. He ain't in his bed now, either, but more than three hours out of the twenty-four, and he don't sleep then. Didn't that doughboy, the steward, tell me of a, tell me that of a morning he always finds the old man's hammock, clothes all rumpled and tumbled, and the sheets down at the foot, and the cover lid almost tied into knots, and the pillow was sort of frightful hot as though a baked brick had been on it? A hot old man! I guess he's got what some folks ashore call a conscience. It's a kind of tick dolly row, they say, worse nor a toothache. Well, well, I don't know what it is, but the Lord keep me from catching it. He's full of riddles. I wonder what he goes into av into the afterhold for every night, as Doughboy tells me he suspects. What's that for, I should like to know? Who's made appointments with him in the hold? Ain't that queer now? But there's no telling. It's the old game. Here goes for a snooze. Damn me, it's worth a fellow's while to be born into the world, if only to fall right asleep. And now that I think of it, that's about the first thing babies do, and that's sort of queer too. Damn me, but all things are queer to come to think of them. But that's against my principles. Think not, is my eleventh commandment, and sleep when you can, is my twelfth. So here it goes again. But how's that? Didn't he call me a dog? Blazes! Call me ten times a donkey, pile a lot of jackasses on top of that. He might as well have kicked me and done with it. Maybe he did kick me and I didn't observe it. I was so taken all aback with his brow somehow. It flashed like a bleached bone. 
What the devil's the matter with me? I don't stand right on my legs. Coming afoul of that old man is a sort of torn, turn me wrong inside out. By the Lord, I must have been dreaming, though. How, how, how? But the only way is to stash it. So here goes to hammock again. And in the morning, I'll see how this plaguey juggling thinks over by daylight. Chapter 30, The Pipe When Stubb had departed, Ahab stood for a while, leaning over the bulwarks, and then, as had been usual with him of late, calling a sailor of the watch, he sent him below for his ivory stool, and also his pipe. Lighting the pipe at the, bin the, the binnacle lamp, and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. In old Norse times... The thrones of the sea-loving Danish kings were fabricated, saith tradition, of the tusks of the Norwhale. How could one look at Ahab then, seated on that tripod of bones, without be thinking of the be thinking him of the royalty it symbolized, for a Khan of the plank, and a king of the sea, and a great lord of Leviathans was Ahab. Some moments passed, during which the thick vapor came from his mouth in quick and constant puffs, which blew back again into his face. How now, he soliloquized at last, withdrawing the tube. The smoking no longer smooths, soothes. Oh, my pipe! Hard it must, my hard must it go with me if thy charm be gone. Here have I been unconsciously toiling, not pleasuring, I and ignorantly smoking to windward all the while, to windward and with such nervous whiffs, as if, like the dying whale, my final jets were the strongest and fullest of trouble. What business have I with this pipe, this thing that is meant for sereneness, to send up mild white vapors among the mild white hairs, not among torn iron gray locks like mine? I'll smoke no more. He tossed the still-lighted pipe into the sea. The fire hissed in the waves. The same instant the ship shot by the bubble, the sinking pipe made. With slouched hat, Ahab lurchingly paced the planks. Chapter 31, Queen Mab. Next morning, Stubb accosted Flask. Such a queer dream, King Post, I never had. You know the old man's ivory leg? Well, I dreamed he kicked me with it. When I tried to kick back upon my soul, my little man, I kicked my leg right off. And then, presto, Ahab seemed a pyramid, and I, like a blazing fool, kept kicking at it. But what was still more curious, Flask, you know how curious all dreams are? Through all this rage that I was in, I somehow seemed to be thinking to myself that, after all, it was not much of an insult, that kick from Ahab. Why, thinks I, what's the row? What's the row? Row? I th it's not a real leg, only a false leg. And there's a mighty difference between a living thump and a dead thump. That's what makes a blow from the hand flask, 50 times more savage to bear than a blow from a cane. The living member that makes the living insult, my little man. And thinks I to myself all the while, mind, while I was stubbing my silly toes against that cursed pyramid, so confoundedly contradictory was it all, all the while I say, while thinking, I was thinking to myself, what's his leg now but a cane, a whalebone cane, yes, thinks I, it was only a playful cudgeling, in fact, only a whaleboning that he gave me, not a base kick, besides, thinks I, look at it once, why, at the end of it, the foot part, what a small sort of end it is, whereas if a broad-footed farmer kicked me, there's a devilish broad insult. But this insult is whittled down to a point only. But now comes the greatest joke of the dream, Flask. While I was battering away with, at the pyramid, a sort of badger-haired old merman, with a hump on his back, takes me by the shoulders and slews me around. What are you about, he says he. Slid, man. But I was frightened. Such a fizz. But somehow, next moment, I was over the fight. What am I about, says I at last, and what business is that of yours, I should like to know, Mr. Humpback? Do you want to kick? By the Lord, Flask, I had no sooner said that than he turned around his stern to me, bent over, and dragging up a lot of seaweed he had for a clout. What do you think I saw? 
By Thunder Alive Man, his stern was stuck full of marlin spikes with the points out. Says I, on second thoughts, Guess I won't kick you, old fellow. Why stub, said he. Why stub? And kept muttering it all the time, sort of eating of his own gums like a chimney hag. Seeing he wasn't going to stop saying over his why stub, why stub, I thought I might as well fall to kicking the pyramid again. But I had only just lifted my foot for it when he roared out. Stop that kicking. Halloa, says I. What's the matter now, old fellow? Looky here, says he. Let's argue the insult. Captain Ahab kicked he, didn't he? Yes, I did. Yes, he did, says I. Right here it was. Very good, says he. He used his ivory leg, didn't he? Yes, he did, says I. Well then, he says he. Why, Stub? What do you have to complain of? Didn't he kick you with right good will? It wasn't a common pitch my pine leg he kicked you with, was it? No, you were kicked by a great man and with a beautiful ivory leg, Stub. It's an honor. I consider it an honor. Listen, why, Stub? In old England, the greatest lord think it great glory to be slapped by a queen and made garter knights of. But be your boast, Stub, that ye were kicked by old Ahab and made a wise man of. Remember what I say, be kicked by him. Account his kicks honors, and on no account kick back. For you can't help yourself, white wise Stub. Don't you see that pyramid? With that, he all of a sudden seemed somehow, in some queer fashion, to swim off into the air. I snored, rolled over. There I was in my hammock. Now what do you think of that dream, Flask? I don't know, but it seems a sort of foolish to me, though. Maybe, maybe, but it's a made it's made a wise man of me, Flask. Do you see Ah Ahab standing there, sideways looking over at the stern? Well, the best thing you can do, Flask, is to let the old man alone. Never speak to him, whatever he says. Halloa, what's that he shouts? Hark. Masthead there, look sharp, all of ye. There are whales hereabouts. If see if ye see a white one, split your lungs for him. What do you think of that now, Flask? Ain't there a small drop of something queer about that, eh? A white whale. Did he mark that man? Look ye. There's something special in the wind. Stand by for it, Flask. Ahab has that that's bloody on his mind. Has that that's bloody on his mind. But, Mom, he comes this way. All right. We've read nine chapters. Thank you for joining me. I hope this was fun. I got my second Moderna shot today, so I'm not at my at the top of my game, but I hope I did okay by the text. There's a lot of interesting stuff here. A lot of new characters. The ship has left the harbor. We met Ahab. A lot of stuff. So thank you for joining me. Um, I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow, depending on the side effects of my vaccination, but I'll see you soon.